morning everyone and uh, welcome to class thank you all for uh, joining class uh, this morning we are going to begin our study of romans chapter 7 okay so before we begin our study of romans chapter 7 can one of you please lead us in prayer please Father, we thank you for this wonderful time, Lord. And once again, we come to your presence, Lord, as we're going to study about the book of Romans, Lord. Give us wisdom, knowledge to understand more deeply. Give us revelation from your word, Lord. Thank you for teaching us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so in Romans chapter six, uh, 6, Paul has established the fact that we have been justified freely by the grace of God. We've been made righteous in God's sight and we have a standing in grace. And then he says how we then, you know, live victorious over sin. Okay. So he's, he talks about how we can live victorious over sin. In chapter six, also, we know that Paul presents the truth of our spiritual identification, the truth of our uh, identification, that through our identification with Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his uh, ascension, you know, that the power of sin over our lives has been broken. We no longer have the sinful nature in our person, which exits, it exerts its influence from inside out. Okay. Uh, and but we have the nature of God that is in um, us. Okay. And so he talks about the spiritual truth, the spiritual identity, uh, or our, our spiritual identification, which he refers to as the positional truth that we have in Christ. Okay. And then he goes on in uh, to explain in chapter six, the practical actions. We saw that last week, right? The practical actions that we can take in order to walk experientially in the spiritual reality in Christ. Okay. So coming to Romans chapter seven now, um, now Romans chapter seven is quite a challenging chapter for those who study the uh, Bible. Why is it a challenging chapter for those who study the Bible? Because Paul refers himself as I in several places in this, uh, in this chapter. And it's not very clear to people whether he's talking about himself before he was saved or after he was saved. Okay, so it's not clear whether he was talking about himself as being saved and struggling in the flesh or where was Paul in his spiritual journey when he refers to himself in Romans chapter 7? So that is a big puzzle. That's a big question. Was he talking about himself before he was born again, before he came into Christ? Or is he talking about himself as a new believer and struggling in the uh, flesh. So that's a big question. So he's, uh, so when they are trying to say is, or what they are trying to say, that is if you are a believer, you know, based on this chapter and assuming that Paul is talking about the I, which is referring him to of referring to himself. And they're saying that the I that he's talking about is after he's received Christ Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he's still struggling to, you know, uh, uh, with the battle in the flesh. He's still struggling uh, with this issue of uh, the cravings of the carnal nature. So for those of the scholars and those of them who take this standpoint, they are saying that as believers, for the rest of our life, we are going to struggle with sin. So that is one standpoint, okay? But the view I like to share, or we are standing as a church, and we are not forcing this idea on anyone. So if you're convinced from Romans chapter 7, even as we read it, even as we study it, and as you look for it yourself, you can make your decision. Okay. But we are convinced that Paul is talking about himself, or I am also convinced that Paul is talking about himself, you know, in this chapter as someone who is unsaved, an unsaved person under the law. So an unsaved person under the law is a person who's basically not able to overcome the cryings or the cravings or the desires of the uh, flesh. Okay. And um, he's talking, uh, Paul is talking here of his struggles as a good man, 
you know, good man means, yes, under the law, unsaved person, but he's saying even though he was unsaved, uh, even though he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, under the law, he's not under Christ, he's not yet saved, he says he's a good man, you know, but then when we move on to Romans 8, he's talking about salvation and the life of uh, Christ in that, okay. So, our take or my take here is that no, Paul is not talking about when he's referring himself as I in this chapter, he's not referring to himself as someone who is born again, who has received Christ and still yielding to the cravings of his flesh or still giving into the weakness of the flesh because that is not our stand that is not what the word of God teaches us you know and that is not what Paul is also teaching us in chapters 4 and in chapter 5 in chapter uh, uh, sorry in chapters 5 and chapter 6 in chapter 6 what does he say about sin as a believer what is believers connection to sin what is a believers connection to sin yeah, is dead to sin, yes. So person is dead to sin. So how can Paul in chapter 7, when he's talking about himself and saying that, you know, how can he say that he's, as a believer he's still struggling in sin when he's already told us in chapter 6 that, hey, we are dead to sin, right? So he cannot be talking or referring to himself as someone who is um, a saved person, a believer and struggling with sin. He's talking about himself as someone who is unsaved, okay, under the law uh, and struggling with sin, okay? When we look at, uh, and you read chapter 7, you'll understand. But uh, are you able to understand what I'm trying to say? So there is this big conflict, two kind of viewpoints. So in our understanding, even as we read Romans 7, you know, Whatever has been said does not apply to a life of a believer. He's talking about somebody who is under the law, under sin. It applies to somebody in this case. Paul is talking about himself or what was his life when he was unsaved. But he says, even when I was unsaved, I was, I was a good man, but I was under the law. Okay, so he says, hey, I'm a good man. Maybe he's not indulging in any, you know, sinful things and all that. But he's saying, when I was unsaved, I was a good man, but I was living under the law. And he's saying, and he's talking about his struggles of the things of the flesh. He's showing the struggles of any person who's trying to live right, but does not have the life of God in him or the power of the Holy Spirit in him. Okay, so that is the kind of, a person he's referring or talking to in chapter 7. Because in chapter 6, he's saying, hey, if you are under uh, Christ, you're a slave to uh, Christ, you're the slave of righteousness, you are dead to sin. Sin has no longer any power and authority and dominion over you. And he goes on to talk in chapter 8 and he says, you know, uh, in chapter 8, that how can a person... Uh, you know, overcome the things of the flesh because of the power of the Holy Spirit living in him. So chapter 7, when he's talking and he's referring to himself as I, we cannot say that it's talking about Paul when he was a believer, but it's talking about himself as an unbeliever. Okay, so um, this is how we understand Romans chapter 7. So I wanted us to be aware of the different Bible preachers, different uh, commentary uh, uh, writers, different scholars who see this very differently. While it's quite clear for us that Paul is referring to himself in Romans chapter 7 as someone who's under the law. So some people may say it's a struggle for every believer throughout their life. Sin is a struggle for every believer under their lives. If they look at Romans 7 in the light of, you know, saying that Paul was a believer and he struggled with a sin. But we don't think that is right because he's already told us in Romans chapter 6 that the power of sin is broken. Sin will have no dominion over us. So what is mentioned in Romans 7 cannot be an experience of a believer for the rest of their lives cannot be an experience for a believer that they cannot overcome the deeds or the sinful cravings or the lusts of the flesh for the rest of their 
lives. But it talks about a person who's under the law and not under the power of the Holy Spirit, but yet has a good heart and who is wants to do good. Okay. So in chapter 7, Paul talks about the law, which refers to the Old Testament law. And he also uses law in the context of sin. That means he talks about the law as in terms of something that controls or the dominion of sin. So you need to understand this very carefully. Okay. In chapter 7, in some places when Paul is referring to the word law or he's referring to law, he's talking about the law in the Old Testament. But in some places, in some verses, when he's talking about the law in chapter 7, he is basically not talking about the Old Testament law, but he's talking about the law of sin or the law of death. That means he's talking about the control and the dominion of sin and death, which is using the word law. Did you all understand? So you need to understand the difference. Okay, some places when he's talking about the law, he's referring to the Old Testament law. In some places when he's talking about the law, he's referring to the control, the dominion and the power of sin or death. So he says the law of sin, that means the control, dominion, the power of sin. When he's talking about the law of death, he's talking about the control, the power and the dominion of death that has in our uh, in our bodies. Okay. I hope you all understood that difference. Yes. Yes. Okay. So in this chapter, Paul reveals that just as a believer is dead to sin, the believer is also dead to the law and is therefore free from the law. However, this does not mean the law is sinful or evil in its self. So he's talking about the law. And here we're talking about the Old Testament law. He says the believer is also dead to the law and is therefore free from the law. But when he's saying that, he does not mean that the law is bad or the law is sinful or that the law is evil in itself. He says, no, the law is good. When God gave the Old Testament law, he gave it, it served a purpose. What was this purpose that God gave the law? The law was given so that it can make us aware of sin. It can, it can show us, it can reveal to us, hey, you have broken the law. You have done a sinful thing. You've gone against God. Okay, And so he says, the more we are made aware of sin, the more we want to break it. We'll talk about that. Okay, And then he says, why do we want to break it? The law makes us aware of sin, right? Only if you know that, you know, how do we know the traffic signal that the red is stop, the green is go. And if you, and if it shows red stop and you still go, you know, you have broken the law. How do you know? Because the law is being made. If there was no law about the red, red signal and the green signal, even if it was red and you go, you would not think that you have broken the law, right? So the sin, the law was given to make us aware of sin. And it says the more we are made aware of sin, the more we want to break the law. Why do we want to break it? He says, because sin is dwelling in us. And in my, he says, Paul says, in my flesh, there is no good thing. Okay. And then he talks about the law of sin that is working in my flesh. The law of sin means the control or the power of the dominion of sin that is working in my flesh, that is controlling my flesh, that is, you know, getting me to do and give in to my sinful, uh, fleshly, carnal desires and nature. And he's saying that sin is a law and is now controlling my body. Sin is a law means what? Sin is a power. Sin is a control. Sin is a dominion that is controlling my body. Okay. So the real problem Paul is saying is not the law, the Old Testament law, but sin that rules and dominates the flesh and the members of our body. Members of the body means different parts of our body. Okay. Now the law required people to do things in the strength of their flesh, right? When God gave the law, he expected people to follow the law and he expected them to follow the law according to their flesh. That is why God says in the Old Testament, 
I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon your heart and your mind and my spirit will cause you to keep and obey all my laws and commandments. Why does God say that? Because he knew that the law was given to the people, but they had to keep the law according to their, in their own flesh. Okay. And hence he says, okay, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit is going to come and he is going to help you to follow my laws that I have given you. Okay. So the law required people to do things in the strength of the flesh. Okay, which was impossible because why is it impossible to uh, keep the law in the strength of our flesh? Because sin is already dominating our flesh. Are you able to understand? Sin is dominating our flesh. Sin is controlling, having power and dominion over our flesh. And because sin is having control and dominion of our flesh, you know, our flesh is weak and we are not able to keep the law that is why we end up breaking the law so that's why he says you know the more i'm made aware of sin the more i break it why do i break it i know i shouldn't be breaking it but sin is controlling my flesh sin is having control and dominion and power over my uh, flesh is dominating my flesh so he says so sin was accentuated that means sin was more noticeable by the law and only further expose the weakness of my flesh. So what did the law do? The law said, okay, if you don't do this, if you, you're not supposed to do this, 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 you're supposed to do this, this, this. Now, if you do what you're not supposed to do, the law says, hey, you have broken the law. Okay. And then what it exposes, it exposes your weakness of your flesh. You're saying, hey, I cannot overcome anger. How much ever I try, when somebody tells me something, I just shout, I just scream, I just bang doors, I just throw things. I cannot control my anger. I can, cannot control my emotion. Or, you know, um, uh, when somebody does something to you, you know, you're so filled with hatred. Oh, that person told me I don't want anything to do with them. And you're thinking, why am I like this? Why can't I overcome this? Uh, you know, this this weakness in my flesh. So he's saying that sin made the law noticeable. We were able to know what is the law. We know we're able to break the law. But it also further exposed our weakness of our flesh. Hey, I cannot overcome this. I cannot stop telling lies. I cannot stop. Uh, however I try, I cannot stop using bad words. Okay. So it exposes the weakness of the flesh and then paul highlights the struggle we face in the flesh where sin has dominated our bodies for so long right you know before we are born again we were you know in the sinful nature sin dominated our uh, flesh for so long so paul is also highlighting our struggle with overcoming the flesh and the desires and the cravings of the flesh and so he prepares us for the truth that he reveals in chapter 8 on how to overcome the law of sin and death that means in chapter 8 he's telling us hey how can you overcome the power the control the dominion of sin and death that is working in our flesh and he says it is by the power of the holy spirit so you see how beautifully paul is building it up right yes or no in chapter 6 he says hey we are dead to sin you know sin has no longer any control then he ends up chapter by saying even if you're dead to sin there is something in the weakness of the flesh okay he gives us action points but why aren't we able to do those action points because of the weakness of the flesh and then here he talks about you know uh, how we struggle in the weakness of the flesh and then he goes on to chapter 8 to talk about how to the power of the holy spirit you know we can overcome the weaknesses of the flesh okay so this was briefly an overview of the chapter now let's study this chapter in detail okay so can somebody please read romans chapter 7 verses 1 to 6 please <clears throat> what do you not know Brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, 
that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives but if the husband dies she is realized released released from the law of her husband so then if while her husband lives she marries another man she will be called an adulteress but if her husband dies she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she has married another man therefore my brother you also have become dead to the law through the body of christ that you may be married to another christ another even to him who was raised from the dead that was should wear fruit to god yeah that we should wear fruit to god for when we were in the flesh the passions of sins which were aroused aroused by the law were at work in our members to wear fruit to death but now we have been delivered from the law having died to what we would held by so that we should serve in the newness newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the later amen thank you so paul is speaking specifically in this chapter he is talking to jewish believers those who are familiar with the law the law that was given to moses the law of moses why jews he's talking because they had the law and hence he's not referring to the gentiles okay why are we saying that it is jewish believers because he calls them brethren so why are we saying that paul is specifically here talking to the jewish believers is because he is you know the jews are the law hence he is not referring to the gentiles and also why are we saying it is jewish believers is because he calls them brethren okay so he is talking about life before and after they are in christ life before they were in christ and life after they are in christ and how their life was changed okay how their life was change when they become you know they come into christ so before the jewish brethren were under the law but now he's impressing upon them you know he's telling them or helping them understand that they are free from the law okay so to help them understand this he's using an analogy of a wife okay so as a wife by law she is bound to her husband okay and if her husband dies she is free to marry someone else so paul is saying brethren i want you to know okay in verse 4 he says you have been dead to to the law through our identification with christ or us being in christ so this is a shift that has taken place he saying we were outside the body of christ now he saying we are in the body of christ we are in christ when he says we are outside the body of christ we are under the law now that we are in christ okay we are part of the body of christ he uses the phrase you are married to an other okay because the law is dead and as far as a believer is concerned the law is dead it is over it is uh, gone now they are part of the body of christ and they are married married means what spiritually united with christ so he's talked about a spiritual identification right a spiritual unity with christ his death his burial his resurrection uh, his ascension that is how we are spiritually united with christ or spiritually united to christ and so he's saying hey before we are born again we were under the law you know but now since we are believers you know we are dead to the law and we are now married uh, to christ that means we are spiritually united with christ and we are one with christ we are in christ and we are the body of christ okay look at verse 5 and verse 6 he says when we were in the flesh it means that you know they are 
uh, he's talking about now people who are not believers but living in the sinful past so when we were in the flesh when we were living in the sin in our uh, in the sinful past he says the sinful passions aroused by the law that means he's saying the sinful passions were highlighted by the law what does it mean the sinful passions aroused by the law it doesn't mean that the law that god gave moses arouses us to sin it doesn't or give in to sinful passions no it's saying the sinful passions were highlighted by the law which means it is the law that said do not steal do not kill do not commit adultery do not covet so he's saying if there was no law these passions would look very very normal how do we know that this is sinful passions how do we know that this is sinful lustful passions how do we know this is adultery how do you know this is uh, killing somebody is wrong how do you know stealing is wrong it is because the law was given to us so he's saying the sinful passions were highlighted by the law which means you know the sinful passions showed us that hey we are what we are doing what we are indulging in is sin it is against the law of god okay and he's saying it then it helps us to know that hey this is not normal this is not what we should be doing so he's saying you know before we had the law we could have said hey everyone is doing i am also doing it right everyone is stealing everyone is copying everyone is using bad words everyone is committing adult most so many of them are committing adultery i am also doing it there is nothing wrong but these things when seen in the light of the law okay which god gave people realize that they have done something that is wrong how do they know it because the law says it is wrong so these sinful passions he saying worked in the members of our body so when before we came into christ these sinful passions and desires that ruled our body that controlled our body okay that were part in the members of our body what did it do it yielded us to given to those sinful lustful passions and desires and what was the result of it the result of it was death okay look at verse 6 he says but now we have been delivered from the law okay so he says when we are under the law without christ that is before we are born again we were living bound by sinful passions that were highlighted by the law but now we are delivered from the law so we are now part of the body of christ and we are living in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter that means letter means the law right the law has words so we are not living according to the letter we are not living according to the law but we are living according to the newness of the spirit so he is contrasting here in these verses you know um that we read verses uh, 1 to verse 6 he's basically contrasting you know um um uh, the two lives the life under the law which he refers to as the oldness of the letter and the life that is a born again believer's life and which he says the newness of the spirit okay so the life under the law and the life under the spirit that is what he is talking about contrasting two lives he said and then he's saying you know life in the spirit is what we are married to christ that means we are spiritually in union with christ our spiritual identification with christ we are in christ which he refers to as the newness of the spirit okay so the main point in this uh, uh, in these six verses he's getting the jewish believers chapter verses 1 to verse 6 of chapter 7 what is the main point he's getting the jewish believers to understand that we are not under the law anymore we are free from the law because now we are in the body of christ and we are serving god in the newness of the spirit okay this is a cross reference i would like us to look at galatians chapter 5 verse 18 so can somebody please read galatians chapter 5 verse 18 please
18 Galatians chapter 5 verse 18 but when you are di directed by the spirit you are not under obligation to the law of Moses it says if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law okay why are you not under the law because the holy spirit is going to help us to keep the law and much more than the law okay what is the much more than the law is the holy spirit is going to help us to bear the fruit of the spirit and in galatians chapter 5 you know after paul lists the fruit of the spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control what does he say against such things there is no law right so it does not mean that the hey because Paul is saying we are dead to the law, we don't need the Old Testament law. We don't need the Ten Commandments. We don't need the other laws. No, that is not what he's saying. He's saying that the Holy Spirit will help us to keep the law and much more than the law. Okay, the Holy Spirit will help us to bear the fruit of the Spirit because against that there is no law. And he says the law cannot hold anything against us why because when you walk in the spirit you are not under the law that means when you walk under the spirit you are no longer under the curse the condemnation and the consequences of not keeping the law what is the consequences of not keeping the law death right and also the consequences of not keeping the law is curse in deuteronomy chapter 28 god lists out tells the people of israel hey if you keep my commandments all of these blessings you'll receive if you don't keep my blessing obey my commandments you will receive all of these curses so when we are born again we are part of the new covenant and under the new covenant that is what paul says in romans chapter 8 Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means what? When we are under the law, when we break the law, what, what, how, what does the law make us feel? Guilty, shameful, condemned. But now when we are under the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not that we are done away with the law. It's not that we are free from the law, that we can do whatever we want. No, the Holy Spirit that you know helps us to keep the law that god writes in our hearts and in our minds and helps us to do much more than uh, that so when you are under holy spirit you're not under the law so hence in romans chapter 7 verse 6 you know we are in the paul is saying we are in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter of the law and he's telling the jewish believers hey you don't have to live under the law so why is he writing to the jewish believers because they were so bound up to the law law covenants you know uh, their forefathers everything was so uh, great for these uh, people so he's saying hey you're not anymore bound by the uh, law because you are now in the newness of the spirit okay and then he goes on to talk about the law and the struggle with sin in uh, verse 7 following so can somebody please read verses 7 to 12 of roman chapter 7 please where he talks about the law not being bad verse 7 well then am i suggesting that the law of god is sinful of course not in fact it was the law that showed me my sin I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there was no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law commands which was supposed to bring life brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy and its commands are holy and right and good. Amen. Thank you. So in these verses, Paul is addressing the whole aspect of the law. 
he has just told the Jewish believers that we are not under the law, we are free from the law, we are in the body of Christ, we are married to another, that is we are married to Christ, we are in union with him, one with him, and we are serving God in the newness of the spirit. It's okay, Nickel, this is fine, thank you. Yeah. So he begins uh, this uh, portion of uh, chapter 7 by asking a rhetorical question. Okay, so we know a rhetorical question is a question that asks and it is, you know, the answer is very implicit or, you know, he himself answers. So he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Okay, and then he says, certainly not. Okay, so the rhetorical question is, is the law sinful? So Paul is saying, hey, we're dead to the law. You know, the law is no more, uh, you know, is binding on us and all of that. So the, he's thinking, okay, when the Jews reading this, my letter, the question that will arise in the mind is, okay, is the law sinful? So then he says, no, absolutely not. You know, certainly not. It's not sinful. Okay. There is no problem with the law. So you can, even we can ask, hey, is there a problem with the law? Because Paul is saying, you know, the law... Uh, accentuated sin, it highlighted sin. The law just told us to keep, uh, you know, the ordinances of God, but did not give us the strength to fulfill it. So is the law, uh, you know, is, is the law bad? Is there a, there's a problem with the law? Certainly not. The problem is not with the law. Okay. And he concludes in verse 12 by saying that the law is, what is the law? In verse 12, he says, holy, holy good and just okay so he's saying there's no problem with the law the whole law is holy the commandments are holy just and good because it's given to us by god god cannot give us anything that is not good perfect or holy so he's saying the problem is not the law the problem is because of the laws uh, 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 of uh, the, the law of sin that became very very powerful so now you have to listen carefully He's saying the problem is not the law. That means the problem is not with the law that God gave Moses. But he's saying the problem is because of the law of sin. That means the law of sin means what? The control of sin, the power of sin and the dominion of sin. And he's saying sin became very, very powerful. And that, that sin became a law. It became something that controlled me over Powered me. Remember, and I told you to the introduction to this chapter, when he talks about law, it can be seen in two contexts. One is the law that he gives us, has given to Moses. Second, when he talks about the law of sin or the law of death, it means that the control, the power and the dominion of sin and death. So he's saying the problem is not with the law. The problem is the law of sin or the control, dominion, the power of sin that became very, very powerful. Okay. Um, which means he's saying, I know now that there is something called sin. Okay. How does he know there's something called sin? Because the law was given. And then he says, I realized that I could not be free from this law or could not be free from this sin. Why can't I be free from sin? Because every time I do something that is wrong, the law is telling me, ting tong, you've broken the law. Right? Hey. You've done something that is wrong. Or your conscience telling you, your inner voice, the inner law. Remember in chapter 1, we, we talked about that? The inner law that is given to us is our conscience. The conscience tells us, hey, you've broken the law. So the law highlights my weakness for sin. Okay. So in this passage, it's very interesting in verse 9. Paul says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what does it mean? Does it mean that once the law was given, once the commandments were given, then I became all the more sinful or I, I yielded to sin all the more and then I died? What is the meaning of it? Okay. So this is a very challenging verse for many to understand what is the meaning of this uh, verse so in this verse paul is referring to himself okay when was paul in this state and how do we understand this verse correctly 
the best of our understanding. Okay. The best person to ask is Apostle Paul himself. Hey, what are you writing here? Okay. Now, because he's dead and gone, we cannot ask Apostle Paul. All we can ask is we can ask the help of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So he says when he was without the law or he did not have the understanding of the law. That means he did not have the understanding of what is good or bad. He's talking about that age in his life. When he did not have an understanding of what is good and bad or what is right and wrong. And he did not know what he had to submit to. Okay. So I just like to share some, uh, I share this thought here. This is not definitive, but is very indicative. Okay. Now, for example, at the age of 12, when you come to an age of 12, you begin to understand laws and rules and commandments. Yes or no? Okay. In the context of how do you understand commandments, rules, and laws in the context of, you know, uh, the bigger picture. You're able to see the bigger picture that, hey, there is a God. Okay. You, till then, maybe till the age of 10 or, you know, whatever, or 10 below, every time a child does something wrong, they know if I do something wrong, what is there? I'm going to disobey my parents. I am not going to get to watch TV or go out to play or I'm not going to get what I'm asking or get a snack. I'm going to get a good beating and a good punishment. Okay. So how are they associating doing the right thing or the wrong thing? They're associating it with rewards or punishment. Okay. But when we come to the age of 11 and 12 years old, it's no longer rewards and just punishment. It is, hey, I'm doing something against God. Okay. So he's saying when he came to that place where he understood that commandments or the laws that are given, having to do with their relationship with God. Hey, keeping the law is just not keeping it for the sake of keeping it, but it is my relationship with God. And that is why God was telling the people in the Old Testament, don't bring those sacrifices, men. Because those sacrifices are no use. Why? Because you're simply bringing it. You're bringing all these blemished animals, sick animals. And he tells them in Haggai and Malachi, you take these animals and give it to your governor. Will you accept it? Then how can you bring it to me? And God says, shut the door of the temple. Your worship or your music is noise to my ears. That means all of that they were doing was just like a ritual. Right? There was no un deeper meaning and significance. Oh, I broke the law. I have to do this. Okay, let me go to the temple, just offer the sacrifice. But there was no this one that, oh, I have broken the heart of God. There was no deeper connect or relationship with uh, God. Okay. So here in verse 9, when Paul says, I came to an understanding of the law, he's saying, I knew I was accountable to the standard of the law. That means he came to a place where he understood the commandment as having to do with God. Not just breaking and keeping the law, getting blessings, getting curses. But he's saying having in my relationship with God, I was able to understand how keeping the law, breaking the law had to do with my relationship with God. And then he says, sin revived and I died. Which means, he says, you know, there was no way to overcome sin. He's talking about the past life, right? There's no way to overcome sin because, you know, the power of sin dominated my body. Sin took a hold of me. That is him. Paul is talking about himself. And he says, I died to sin. That means what? I did not keep the law. I kept on sinning, kept on giving into my carnal nature because the power of sin was controlling and dominating my uh, body. The fleshly carnal nature is controlling and dominating my body. And what was the result of it? The result of sin is death. That means not just spiritual death or physical death. He's talking about corruption and destruction and decay in the body. Okay, what is the corruption and decay in the body? Sicknesses, weaknesses, um, no peace of mind, uh, oppression, depression, bondages, everything. So he says, you know, sin revived and I died. That means sin brought about decay. Sin also brings corruption and destruction to the body. 
body. Okay. Verse 8, he says, when the understanding of the commandment came, the awareness of sin came. Now, what is sin? Sin is basically not keeping the law or sin is the violation of the law. It is breaking of the commandments. So Paul is saying, hey, sin produced in me all manner of evil desires. Okay. That means the flesh just keeps on, you know, getting me into all manner of evil desires. And Paul saw that in him, all kind of wrong desires were there, which was against the law. Now, when is he talking about himself in this position? When is he talking about himself in this position? Before he accepted or became a believer. Okay, And he says, only when the law was presented to me, I realized that I was sinning. That means only when I was able to understand the law in relationship with God, I realized that I was sinning. Not only did I realize I was sinning, I also realized that the power of sin is at work in me and there is all manner of evil desire in me which is causing me to break the law or causing me to sin. And then he progresses in his letter in uh, verses 13 to 20, 25 where he focuses not just on the law but the sin, the sinful and evil desires that is there in the person. Okay, we'll stop here. We just have a minute and we'll um, study verses 13 to 25 tomorrow. Any questions? Are you all able to understand? It's quite a, uh, the sun, but it's quite interesting, right? Any questions? Anyone has any questions? No questions? Well, able to understand? Yes? Okay. Okay, if there are no questions. Online students, any questions from you all? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll end class. Thank you all for joining class. Have a blessed day ahead. Thank you. God bless you.